Haven of Rest Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson Number One, Sunday, September 3rd, 2017, the start of the fall quarter. The lesson is entitled The Rainbow. The lesson comes from Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. We were asked to read Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through chapter 9, verse 17. The place is mountains of Ararat. The time is unknown. This Sunday's study begins a detailed examination of the covenants of God. God's covenants are solemn agreements or commitments that he makes with his people. They contain his most important promises, and these can be conditional or unconditional. In our first unit of study, we examined the signs that God instituted for some of his covenants. Today's aim, facts, to understand the promise and the unconditional nature of God's covenant with Noah. Principle, to grow in confidence that God is faithful to his promises. Application, to recall God's promises and faithfulness at all times, especially, for instance, when seeing a rainbow. Illustrating the lesson, the rainbow is the sign of God's faithfulness to his promise. Practical points. One, worship that honors God begins with our obedience. Genesis 8 20. 2. God loves us in spite of our sin and pursues a relationship with us. Verse 21. 3. Everything in creation reveals God's faithfulness. Verse 22. 4. God has included all living creatures in the covenant he established with Noah. Chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. 5. God has given the rainbow as his personal assurance that we can take him at his word. Verses 11 through 13. 5. When difficulties arise in life, remember the promises of God. Verse 14. 7. God will always remember and honor his promises. Verses 15 through 17. Golden text. I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all the flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Genesis 9, 11. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is God's promise coming from Genesis 8, 20 through 22. The second is God's covenant coming from Genesis 9, 8 through 11. And the third is God's token, Genesis 12, Genesis 9, 12 through 17. Introduction. God will keep his word. This is true whether it concerns a promised blessing or a promised judgment. Thousands of years ago, God promised that a great flood was coming, and it came. This week's text comes immediately after the great flood in Noah's day, which was an act of God's retribution on the widespread wickedness of that time. With longevity, what it was prior to the flood, people had both a longer time to produce and a longer time to increase in evil. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. God therefore, described, God therefore decided to destroy the earth with the flood and to start over with Noah and his family. God's promise. Genesis 8, 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took off every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet Savior, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. 
neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Verse 22, while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Worship Genesis 8.20 it is hard to imagine a world so evil that Noah and his family were the only ones God considered faithful. During the time Noah was building the ark, the Lord gave ample time to repent. None of them did. However, instead, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Romans 1.25 as one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, 8. And as a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, 5. Noah must have divided his time between building the ark and trying to convince people to obey God. Similarly, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering to us, ward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Chapter 3, verse 9. Destruction of our current world will come by fire. Verse 10. However, not by water. Given instructions concerning the building of the ark, Genesis 6, 14 through 16, Noah and his family prepared for the inevitable, namely a catastrophic flood that would destroy all flesh. Verse 17. Even in the midst of the death and destruction that we eventually come, God would establish a covenant with Noah and the animals he was to gather in the ark, verses 18 through 19. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he, verse 22. As to the size of the ark, it was 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high essentially a large box. It had room enough for 7,000 species of animals, according to one estimate. Not only did it rain for 40 days and nights, Genesis 7, 4, but also all the foundations, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, verses 11. Hence, there was water coming from above and from below. We can imagine tidal waves sweeping in from the oceans, destroying everything in their paths. Such powerful forces no doubt account for some of the changes to the Earth's topography that some claim required millions of years to create. Even a relatively small flash flood can sweep away homes and bridges. Just imagine what 40 days of steady rain would do. Only the safety of the ark could weather such a storm. After being in the ark for a while, over a year, Genesis 7, 11, 8, 13 through 14, Noah's family was finally able to emerge from their place of refuge to begin again in a cleansed world. As both an act of worship and gratitude, Noah built it an altar unto the Lord, Genesis 8:20. Although altar can be used metaphorically, Hebrews 13.10, it usually refers, as it does here, to a stone structure with, upon which animals were slaughtered and burned. This was the primary setting for worship during the patriarchal period. Altars would later be found in both the tabernacle and the temple. Pagans likewise used altars in their worship of false gods. While the distinction between clean and unclean animals would be more detailed in the Mosaic Law, Leviticus 11, such distinctions were known in Noah's day. But under the New Covenant, Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice eliminated the need for any animal sacrifices. Hebrews 9, 24-26, 10, 1-12. Dietary regulations also have been repealed. Colossians 2, 16 through 17. Waywardness, Genesis 8, 21. God was pleased that Noah was grateful for his family's deliverance from the flood. They were now committed to serving him as they resumed their lives in a new cleansed world. 
throughout scripture, there are numerous anthropomorphisms or descriptions of God in human-like terms. This is what we find in Genesis 8.21, where it says, The Lord smelled a sweet Savior. Since God is a spiritual being, John 4.24, who is beyond our full of comprehension, Isaiah 55.9, and dwells in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 6.16, anthropomorphism, Language can help us understand what we cannot otherwise comprehend. Here the expression depicts God's satisfaction with Noah's offering. God then promised to never curse the earth as he had done during the flood. That the earth still does not yield its full potential is the result of the fall in the beginning, Genesis 3.17. But in the end, that curse, along with all others, will be, re will be forever removed. Genesis 22, 3. In spite of the fact that righteous Noah was rescued from the ravages of this catastrophic deluge, the sin nature had not been eradicated from the human race. Indeed, the Lord confirmed the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Genesis 8.21. We do not even need scripture to tell us this. All we have to do is observe our world or look within our own hearts. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9. While Christians continue to debate the nature and consequences of the fall, it is clear that something is wrong with us and that it goes back to the very beginning of time and comes down to us genetically. Psalms 51, 5, Romans 5, 12. This, however, does not mean we bear no responsibility for our sinful choices. James 1, 13 through 15. Weather. Genesis 8, 22. Besides the promise to spare the world from another cataclysmic flood, the Lord also determined that the cycle of nature would continue unaltered to the very end of time. This does not mean that there will be no floods or fires, tornadoes or tempests, droughts or disasters. As we all know, some winters are longer than others and some harvests are earlier than others. We can have warm days in winter and cold days in summer, but genuinely speaking, we can depend on the weather patterns being fairly normal, fairly uniform. If they were not, farmers would have a difficult time knowing exactly what to plant and when and where to plant various crops, nor could they anticipate harvest time arriving um, predictably. Of course, local climate differences have to be factored into this promise. The promise of God after the flood concerning the seasons was not just for Noah's benefit, but for all mankind. It was also for as long as the earth remaineth, Genesis 8, 22, God's covenant, chapter 9, verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, verse 9, and I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, and from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more to any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Covenant promises. Genesis 9, 8 through 9. Not only did God make promises to Noah and the entire world, but he also did so in covenantal terms. But before establishing this covenant, the Lord gave some other basic instructions. As with Adam and Eve, Genesis 1, 28, Noah and his family were told to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, 9, 1. 
Unlike the harmony that existed in Eden prior to the fall, the animals were now afraid of humans, verse 2. Noah was told that animals could now be utilized for food, verse 3. Human life, however, was and still is sacred, even requiring a life for a life, verse 6. That is, death was the punishment for taking human life. Regarding the word covenant, Genesis 9.9, 9, it can best be understood by modern readers as a contract or an agreement. In scripture, covenants were made between individuals as well as between God and men. God could make a covenant with an individual or with a nation. As seen here, through, though a covenant could also be made with the entire world. Covenant Participants, Genesis 9, 10 through 11. Since God had commanded Noah to take with him the different varieties of animals on the ark and the animals had been affected by mankind's sin, the aforementioned covenant was also made with the animals. Because of the many different kinds of animals found in the world, some have raised questions concerning both the ability of Noah to capture and then house them in the ark for an entire year. This also raises a question concerning the extent of the flood. While most believe the flood was worldwide, some have suggested it may have been more localized, only requiring the capture of animals in a smaller geographic area. We must not ignore the supernatural nature of all things. God is the one who brought the animals to Noah, Genesis 6, 20, 7, 9, and the one who brought the flood upon the earth, 6, 17. A worldwide flood and the gathering of all kinds of animals was not a problem for God, and clearly the great flood destroyed all the human race in the time of Noah, with the exception of those in the ark, called the Noahic Covenant, this covenant remains in force until the end of time. As already mentioned, this included both man and animals. Although it is now permissible for people to eat animals for food, Genesis 9-3, this permission should not be taken to mean that animals should be abused, haunted to extinction, or slaughtered indiscriminately. Permission to kill animals seemed to have been for survival and sacrifice. Another feature of this covenant was that God would never again destroy the world by a massive flood. Of, co of course, floods still occur, causing loss of property and life. Even so, God promised there will never be another deluge of a worldwide scale as experienced by Noah. Related to the question of the flood's extent, there is extensive evidence of a catastrophic flood in different parts of the world. There are also flood stories that have been handed down in numerous cultures. While the details differ, there are enough similarities in these accounts to conclude that they have a common origin. We, of course, believe that common origin is the Bible. God's token, verse 12. And God said, There is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Verse 14. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Verse 15. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Verse 17, And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Rainbow, Genesis 9, 12-13 Throughout scripture, covenants are frequently identified by certain visible signs, symbols, or tokens. 
The covenant God made with Abraham was identified with the rite of circumcision. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 14. When Israel was told to put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost in Egypt, God declared, And the blood shall be to you for a token unto the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Exodus 12, 13. When the covenant was later ratified, Moses sprinkled blood on all the people. Chapter 24, verses 3 through 8. The Sabbath was also a token. Chapter 31, verses 16 through 17. These and other covenant signs will be explored in future lessons. The frequent blood sacrifices under the Old Covenant have obvious connections with the sacrifice of Christ in the New Testament. God's Spirit is the guarantee, seal, or token of our future inheritance. Ephesians 1, 13-14 It is possible, however, to undergo outward rituals and still be uncircum uncircumcised in heart and ears. Acts seven fifty one. As were many Jewish leaders in the time of the early church. For Noah... As for all who have followed him, the token of the covenant made with the world was not something they did or had done to them. Rather, it was something they saw. The bow in the cloud, Genesis 9.13, was the rainbow we sometimes see after a rain shower. Just as the rainbow would remind Noah of God's promise to never destroy the world again by water, so we should be reminded of all of God's promises when he witnesses when we witness a rainbow revelations genesis 9:14 through 15 unlike some other covenants revealed in the bible the covenant god made with all living creatures in noah's day had no stipulations to be followed by those with whom the lord was making the covenant nor was there any way man could reject the covenant God made it, and he would surely keep it. This is true with any number of promises God makes. Indeed, the blessings of a covenant relationship depends far more on God's faithfulness than our ability to perfectly comply with God's demands. Even our most diligent efforts to please God fall short of perfection. Romans 3.23 Consequently, we are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8, which in fact is the way all people are saved, whether living under the old covenant or the new. Remembrance, Genesis 9.16-17. While the emphasis in this text is that the rainbow would remind God of the covenant he had made with all living creatures, this should not lead us to conclude that God is forgetful and needs the reminders most of us need. Since God knows everything, past, present, and future, we do not have to be concerned about his forgetting, his covenant promises. The wording used by the Lord was most likely designed to stress the reliability of his promises, especially his promise not to destroy the world again by water. This promise is also an everlasting covenant, Genesis 9.16. This stresses the irre irrevocable nature of the covenant. The same kind of language is used later of the aromatic covenant, the subject of next week's lesson. Questions. 1. What do we know about Noah? 2. Why did God send the flood? 3. What was the first thing Noah did after leaving the ark? Why? 4. What does scripture say about man's inclination after the flood? 5. What promise did God make concerning the weather and the seasons? Six, how can we explain God's promise in light of contemporary natural disasters and the eventual end of the world? Seven, what are some questions often raised about Noah's Ark and the Great Flood? Eight, who was included in the Noahic Covenant? Nine, what was the sign of the Noahic Covenant? 10. Why is the covenant described as everlasting? 
This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, September 3rd, 2017. Thank you for listening. God bless.